If you're an entrepreneur, you know what it means to take personal and financial risks, create jobs that support your community, and devote most of your time to your business. But do you know how to plan for a successful exit from your business? Do you know who should be involved in creating your succession or transition plan and the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. The podcast theme is inspired by critically acclaimed business author, Bo Burlingham, author of Finish Big, how great entrepreneurs exit their companies on top. In this podcast, you'll hear success stories of exit plans done right and pick up practical tips based on years of legacy business advisors' expertise and knowledge about the largest and most important financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with your host, Mark Dorman. Hi, Mark. Who do we have with us today? Well, good morning, Wendy. Good morning to our listeners. I hope you are having a great Friday morning here. Our guest is a terrific friend of the show and a friend of Mr. Burlingham's himself, Doug Tatum. Doug, good morning to you. How are you today? Good morning, Mark, and um, I'm uh, thanks for having me. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you for making the time. So, Doug, uh, just to give uh, uh, our listeners some background on uh, Mr. Tatum, he is the uh, chairman of the board of Newport LLC. He is part of the teaching faculty at the Jim Moran Institute for Global Entrepreneurship at Florida State University. He's also the former chairman of the Board of Association for Corporate Growth, ACG, which would be an acronym similar, uh, familiar, excuse me, with all our listeners. Past recipient of the ACG's Lifetime Achievement Award uh, at the Organization for Intergrowth in 2017. Most notably, and how I met you, Doug, is uh, as the author of No Man's Land when you came to speak in the Northeast Ohio market on a couple of different occasions, which in No Man's Land we're going to touch on uh, in great depth, but winner of four National Best Book Awards, and the founding chairman and CEO of Tatum LLC. So without further ado, let's meet Doug Tatum. Doug, great to have you on the show this morning. Thank you for joining us. I want to just start by giving me a little bit of your career background. I, I, one of the things that fascinates about fascinates me with you is, is, is your ability to simplify some of the most complicated issues in the capital markets. I've seen you speak. I've seen you present. Uh, and if you haven't, ladies and gentlemen, by all means, uh, get out and see Doug if you have an opportunity. But uh, I want to start where I met you. It's not necessarily the beginning of your story, but talk to me about No Man's Land. What prompted you to write it? Uh, it's such a powerful book for, for small business owners. And then from there, I want to revisit a little bit of your time at Tatum LLC and then look towards the current uh, picture of Newport. So what was the idea behind No, no Man's Land, Doug? Well, I, I think uh, tequila was involved, actually. It was in a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> and um, I was sitting sitting with my brother. If, if not a tequila, it was a cigar. And um, we were early on in uh, the, the firm Tatum, where, as you know, we were either fractional or consulting CFOs for a lot of companies. And um, I wrote on a paper napkin, I said, you know, the patterns of failure are so consistent and that, that I think that, that they're, it's like they're stuck in no man's land and that's where it came from. Mm. So, so I literally started, you know, talking out loud. My brother was a great foil as he always is to challenge my thinking. And, um, and, and that's where I came up with the, these transitions that happened in a company's alignment with their marketplace, their value proposition, certainly their management. You and I have talked a lot about that, mm -hmm. their economic model and their money. And so I wrote a little pamphlet and just for the hell of it. And um, we started handing it out and that, that took off. And I don't remember how in, in the world Bo Birmingham is actually responsible for the book, my dear friend, because I was contacted by Inc. Magazine. Perhaps maybe I'd done a speech on it somewhere, and uh, he wrote an article on No Man's Land, and apparently mm. that blew up. You, this is this precedes the level of social media that we have now, but it was beginning to kick into gear. And as a result of that, 
I got contacted by an agent who said, you want to write a book? And I said, are you kidding me? I mean, I can write a memo, hmm. uh, but I'm not interested in writing a book. And I remember the agent and, and I said, I'll tell you what you can do. If you find me an editor who writes Harvard business case studies, but also writes fiction, because we're going to have to tell some, you know, uh, lively stories, then yeah, I'm interested and I'll be damned if they didn't do that. And so that's how that book got put together. But Bo, your friend and mine has left his fingerprint in a lot of different places, but he wrote the article that ultimately led to, uh, somebody talking me into writing a book. Yeah. Well, we're glad you did. Uh, you, you made a comment there earlier that the, the patterns are so consistent within organizations and companies that find themselves in no man's land. Uh, take us back. And, and what are those patterns? And if you could elaborate on, uh, you, you just mentioned also the four M. So what are the patterns that you see time and time again? What companies do they affect and what are the four M's? So the, the, the no man's land is directly uh, related that territory to companies that are too big to be small, too small to be big. And if you want to look at the data, I was able to get uh, Dr. David Burks, a brilliant uh, applied mathematician, actually at MIT, ultimately Harvard and MIT. But he had he had designated this term gazelles and had identified that a certain few number of companies generated most of the jobs and they weren't large companies, which was interesting. And so uh, he actually is prominently uh, signed off on a diagram at the front of the book. But um, the, the bottom line is the companies that are affect typically are between at the very bottom around 20 employees. Mm -hmm. Okay. And relative, you can adjust that to the industry and in, a, in, 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 a construction company with 20 permanent employees is going to be a lot more revenue than a consulting firm with 20 employees, but 20 employees. Uh, and then you're, you're dead in the middle of it when you start approaching a hundred employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, that's the, that's who experiences no man's land. The transitions are that, you know, um, it, it's funny you you work with a lot and advise a lot of entrepreneurs, Mark, and do a fantastic job of helping Thank them you. think think through, you know, everything. Uh, how how do they view a business as an owner rather than just an operator, for example, mm -hmm. and and their wealth uh, management, those kind of things. But what's interesting is that when you look at um, how these companies get started. If I go do a speech with three or 400 entrepreneurs and I jokingly say, my students at FSU ask me, how do you become an entrepreneur? And I say, well, you get fired and steal your employer's customers. The place erupts because that's about <laughs> two thirds of the companies. There's that's exactly what started. And then I, I, I talk to them about, you know, how they innovate and the way they innovate is a customer comes up to them or a client or whatever and says, can you do this? And they look deeply into their customer's eyes and they say, yeah, I'm an expert at that. We can do that. And they've never done it in their lives. And they lie. Mm -hmm. As a result of that, they end up getting customers and they're uniquely gifted at meeting those promises, even though they've never met them before. And they build a company early on around their talents but then they hit no man's land and they got to find out, can they get the business good at what they're good at? Which one of those promises is scalable? Which are, which of those value propositions actually does a market want? And that transition is a really tough one because the entrepreneur has got to acknowledge that if the business is really built around him or hers, pure personal talent, which they all have, but that's the business value. They need to stay small and make money. I mean, mm -hmm. there's nothing illegal or immoral about that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times you and I have sat with, with an entrepreneur and said, you have a fantastic business. Quit trying to grow it. Yeah. You're going to grow yeah. it out of business. Stuff, so true. So true. Yeah. yeah. You run out of me. That's so, what I hear a lot of in our client meetings. I, I, I don't have enough, you know, hours in the day and 
you know, the interesting thing is you, as you read uh, No Man's Land, and we're joined this morning by uh, Doug Tatum, author of No Man's Land, but this, this whole idea of breaking through to the next level, uh, you know, you never see business owners, they have no sense unless they've read No Man's Land, what's on the other side, right? As I try to pierce through 20 to 50 to 70 employees, and I incur these step fixed costs that I'm, my business is going to get a lot worse before it gets better. And am I willing to fight the good fight again and again and again, right? So, uh, and this is the pattern of behavior that you see time and time again. Yeah, well, you just mentioned the model, the, the third M, the step fixed costs. You're exactly right. There's a point where the business has to uh, expand its infrastructure ahead of its sales. It's scary as hell, right? You might even uh, lose money during that transition. Yeah. The management's the most difficult because you – your entire, every person out there has an inner circle. People don't realize that, but they have an inner circle. The inner circle is defined for the entrepreneurs who's in the office when the big decisions are made, you know, when they close the door. And what's interesting, the ticket to that inner circle early on is loyalty mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. has to change to performance. And, and when you go from loyalty to performance, you literally face looking somebody in the eyes and saying, um, I could not get or have built this business to where it is without you. Um, but I can't go any farther with you. And that's a brutal conversation. And I, I've that seen inner that. circle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're not, if you're not on this side of the door and the door's closed and you're in the meeting, you're not in the inner circle. Right. Um, but we've seen it, uh, with our client base is it, it's this, this loyalty-based culture that people can't break through. And it's very, very difficult. And, and I think one of the things that I love about your style, so to speak, Doug, is, is where you say, hey, it's not illegal to be loyal to your friends, right? And stay small. There's nothing right. wrong with having a small, great company, nothing right? Nothing wrong with that. Um, and, right. you know, sometimes bigger is not better. And uh, I'm thinking of a client right now where the cost of getting bigger would be too painful. How do you, I mean, particularly what we see, here in Northeast Ohio, uh, on many of our cases and throughout the country, I'm sure, is that the loyalty culture, it could be your own family members, right? Oh, yeah. And that, so that you might be stuck with it. Makes it more, yeah, more painful. So that makes it even more complex and more painful. And um, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it is, it's interesting. We idolize anybody we put up on a stage, you know, uh, They'll introduce and say, you know, uh, uh, Doug Tatum was chairman and CEO of Tatum, and you know we had uh, at one time well more than a, more than a thousand folks, fourteen hundred I think at the max, thirty offices, et cetera. And then I'm supposed to talk about no man's land, and a lot of times what I tell them to start off is I said the most strategic thing you can think about as a, as an entrepreneur is. Uh, whether you really need or have to grow mm. because of that value proposition, because staying small and making money, becoming a small giant, yep. Bo Burlingham wrote a book on it is, is literally, as we say, is not illegal. It's ethical. And a lot of times it's really good business. There's a lot of reasons why when you go from 20, less than 20, there's probably, literally, well, there's, there's 15, 16 million standalone businesses with employees. You get above a hundred employees, Mark, mm -hmm. there might be a hundred thousand. Correct. Yeah. It's rare, 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 In rare. The days, they, yeah. Very rare. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, you've been, you know, the champion of the, uh, the entrepreneur for, for many, many years, uh, the four M's, if I have them correctly, and if I don't, please correct me, but uh, model, management, market, and money, uh, which is the toughest to tackle? Management. You and I know that because you're counseling your clients on, on that issue. It's always management is the toughest. Um, market, where you're trying to identify, do you have a value proposition that will be rewarded at scale is really, really tough. Mm -hmm. But out of, out of, out of the identification of a scalable value proposition, the ability to get the company good at what you're good at originally, 
the ability to, you know, in management, you have to, you have to speed up, increase the speed and lower the risk of decisions. And you cannot do that with people who are learning, you know, going forward. And so uh, if they're learning that job, you've got to reach out and bring in folks that you can hand pieces of the business over to as an entrepreneur and, and, and lower the risk of the business. Mm-hmm. If you can't lower the risk of those decisions, then the chances are you're going to, you're going to have a real difficult time with no man's land. I tell people, and I've run startups. I've, you know, my late twenties, I, I ran a large national business, believe it or not, um, the largest real estate publisher in the United States. It's a hell of a lot easier to run a larger business, mm. not, not necessarily easier to change them, but you can screw up and the thing doesn't go out of business. Exactly. Right. And, yep. you know, I, I remember we, you know, ripped a million dollar piece of technology out of that business. that wasn't working and threw it in the trash can. We could do that. Mm. You, you, it, it, during no man's land, you know, my mom and everybody's mom, I'm sure always said, you know, if you take care of the little things, the big things will take care of yourself. Well, that doesn't work here. It's a few big things. If you don't get them right, you don't get a chance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's really hard, as you know, Mark, for entrepreneurs to be strategic. Yep. Because yep. while they're listening to your podcast, they got emails piling up about all sorts of problems. They don't get away from that. They're not going to make the decisions to get out of it. And the, and the decisions they make are, uh, your expression, the tyranny of the urgent, right? There's always something more important that needs their attention than what's really important in their business, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, as, as it pertains to finishing big, um, I uh, oftentimes uh, provide more often than not uh, copies of No Man's Land because it uh, to to our our new clients and prospective clients, I said, let's talk again. But before we do, let's read this or let's read a particular chapter. The thing I love about No Man's Land is 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 it really kind of drives home that business owners aren't alone, that these uh, dynamics that they're facing are normal, uh, and, and the and the hurdles are normal, and it's not really a reflection on their inability to lead or to sell or to grow. It's just growing pains, if you will. Uh, but you mentioned something that is so true. Why do you find it so difficult? Why do you think it's so difficult for business owners to be and remain strategic? Is it the constant nipping at the heels of the day-to-day? I I think it, well, first of all, I want to to, to, uh, add on to what you said earlier. You have no idea how many times people come up to me and say the single most important thing that they got out of the book was it's the territory, not them. So that's that, I, what your your insight in that is interesting because that's what I get out when I'm talking. Mm-hmm. It's the territory, you know, meaning it, they're they're in they're in a territory of their business yeah, life cycle that is almost predetermined, it, right? Yeah, it's predetermined, and and shortcutting it is is very very difficult. And um, uh, I think that. That's a very, very, very important part of, of you know, strategically understand. Now, is, is why they, why the entrepreneurs get drug into the detail is because if you're going to be a successful entrepreneur, you're a control freak. Yep. Period. The transition of how you how you remain a control freak is different. You cannot outwork no man's land. Okay, and mm. some of these entrepreneurs have. They have uh, t- pain tolerances like a Navy SEAL. Hmm. You know, I mean, they can, <laughs> they, they, you know, and, and what they want to do is they, they create energy. They want their employees around them to generate that. Well, as you get larger, things normalize. People are not as dedicated to the business as you are. You, you're going to have to pay them normal wages for normal performance. Mm-hmm. You can't mm-hmm. build a business of superstars. So what happens is, the entrepreneur has to start taking chunks of this business and, and holding a different inner circle accountable. Keep control. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the misnomer is to say, 
if you want to grow to business, you've got to let go of control is completely, utterly wrong. If you want to grow a big business, you've got to have unbelievable control. You do it differently. Mm-hmm. And that's that transition. You go from managing everything to managing a layer of, of talent. That transition, it's just hard to lead, let the details go. Because mm-hmm. as you know, you run a very successful business. I have. The noise level is always going to be there. If you can't reach into the noise and pick the two or three things, you know, melodies that you've got to concentrate on, then you're, you're just destroyed by the noise. Yeah, that's a uh, great, great insight there. Uh, Doug, talk to us about your role within Florida State University. I know you're very, very passionate about that. You say you're teaching two times a week now. And you're, what courses are you teaching? And I imagine being in a class with you, man, I would have loved to have been in your class had you been one of my professors back in the day. Well, I do, I do invite some entrepreneurs to, to, to hang around my classes. It's good for the students and it's good for them as well. So my role is I'm trying to stamp out ignorance. God help me. Mm. You know, it, it is, um, uh, I get to teach, uh, effectively finance, uh, Venture capital finance, you know, which, you know, can be summarized as follows. Here's what it is. You're never going to get it. So go out and sell something. You know, I can keep that pretty, <laughs> pretty close. To me. But um, no, I, I think it's important that. Um, that in and, and, and the academy, I'm, I'm actually a faculty member. I'm not an adjunct. OK, the academy yeah. has opened the door to what they call specialized uh, faculty. Mm-hmm. So I have a graduate degree, which allows me to do certain things uh, that you can't do. Uh, but as a graduate degree, I don't have a PhD, but they've opened up universities, particularly uh, at Florida State around entrepreneurship. Yep. And they want to expose across the university. Um, I don't, they don't care if you're a physics major, a religion major, a theater major, the notion of how do you innovate? And it's, I think it's a really cool thing. So we have the only separate school of entrepreneurship in the United States for a major research university. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. we were the first. Too. And how, how long have you been at FSU? Seven years now. Yeah, yeah. great, great. Uh, let's switch chan- channels. Our guest uh, this morning is Doug Tatum, uh, chairman and CEO of uh, Newport LLC. Uh Talk to us about Newport LLC. Uh, what was your thought, the genesis behind it? Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a group of extremely seasoned, talented, C-suite executives, senior consultants that are essentially partnering and coming alongside middle market companies to help maximize value, organize professionally, et cetera. Elaborate for us. Well, Newport... Um is uh, an exceptionally talented group of partners and it's a partnership um, and they're all uh, men and women who have led scaled businesses but also have an empathy for an understanding of what it's like to get to that level Mm -hmm. through no man's land and so you could look at it as uh, if you're going to have somebody fly an f-15 at least through the initial uh, training part, you want somebody that's kind of flown an F-15 in the back seat, Mm. okay? And so it's not a consulting firm, it's an advisory firm. Now, but we also specialize in the exit in terms of the investment banking side. Mm -hmm. So you have the value creation where we're sitting there with an entrepreneur thinking through how do we scale? We've interviewed senior management Many, many times we can wave off issues that, you know, we know the ends of a lot of movies. So we can tell the entrepreneur, if we go down here, here's how it's going to live. And as you know, in the capital markets of the money in, there's too much money chasing too few deals in private equity. And so the bulk of their, literally, I think it's 85% of all the deals in the U.S. right now are add-on acquisitions. Yeah, yeah. So... What you end up having to to, to look at with an entrepreneur is you want somebody that says, okay, you either, if you're going to scale, you might have to get into the game of acquiring companies 
grow into a larger size? How are you going to scale? Or you got to look at things strategically and say, you know, you got to sell, you know, and that's, you know, that's why it's so important to have folks in there to help them think about their businesses, wealth management, all those things early on. Not that you're encouraging them to do it. They've got to be prepared and sophisticated about it. And that's, yes. that's what Newport does. Yeah, it's interesting. The capital markets today, are there's so much money out there that everyone and his brother or sister thinks that they're going to sell out to private equity. Uh, when I first met you and you know learned so much from you and from Brent Sapp, your teammate, you know, there is so much money chasing too few deals. And, and it's all about deploying capital in a, in the least risky form as possible. So even in, in, in my practice, working with smaller companies where you're up on the, uh, in the middle market, uh, middle part of the middle market, et cetera, you're still trying to build the attributes and the qualities that will help you to, that help helps an investor or a management team run a future business, succeed your business, allow you to exit with the least amount of risk as possible. What's the biggest risk that you often see is the elephant in the room in some of these middle markets? Is it the management team? All right. So first of all, again, very incredibly insightful, Mark. That's because you, you work in this all the time, but people don't realize it. You know, the entrepreneurs to go to work every day, they always, they, they have to, they have to fill their mind with the potential of the business. Yeah. You know, they got to dream a little farther ahead than reality to go to work. Yeah. Okay. If I can just interject the there, I mean, is, I, I see it so much. I mean, even my own day-to-day -day professional life, you, you know, you'll get your teeth kicked out in on Wednesday and you're jumping out of bed on Thursday with eternal optimism that today is going to be a better day than it was yesterday. Right. But you have yeah, to be, if you're, it, if you, it, if you're yeah. an entrepreneur. You have to you have to have the ability to dream ahead of reality, or you'll never be an entrepreneur. Um, you'll never have the courage to go out and do things uh, without that uh, that imagination. It's a form of an imagination. But the capital markets have no soul, and I'm not referring to the people. I'm referring to money and how you make money. It it, it is it's pure math and time and risk, and you put your hands on it. So what happens is that, and this is in the book too, the way you attract capital is lowering risk mm -hmm. perceived in reality. And the, the, the bottom line is that that's not the way the entrepreneurs think. So for example, you or we at Newport will sit down and say, let's, let's examine the risks of this business and let's take this unique entrepreneurial um, uh, mindset you have, and let's let's de-risk this business because mm -hmm. the the more you de-risk it, the more it's worth, and the more you can access capital. So you asked, what is the biggest risk? And I think that the the biggest risk is that the entrepreneur the entrepreneur doesn't grasp the idea of the value transfer to the buyer. Buyers aren't stupid, not real buyers. And so would you buy your own business is a great question. And they go, Oh, hell no. I know too much about it. So, so, so what happens is when you, when you, if you think strategically and say, okay, you want to sell this when they buy it, how are they going to make more money than you are with it? If you can't answer that question, you're kidding yourself. They're not stupid. Mm -hmm. So what is that? What can I hand to the buyer? So a perfect example is they're running around trying to build a sales force. And the buyer says, no, I really don't need that. I want this from you because you're an add on to this. And the first thing I'm gonna do is get rid of all your sales force. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what they're doing is they're investing in something that the buyer doesn't want strategically and that's a huge risk is that the entrepreneur doesn't think of things in that strategic mindset if you can get them to do it they're really 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 good at, at, at getting there yeah no you're the best at doing that no question about it. our guest uh, this morning has been doug tatum chairman and ceo of newport llc
Doug, this has been wonderful. Uh, tell our listening audience how they can get a hold of you or Newport, please. Well, you just go to Newport LLC. You can get a hold of me that way. Um, and uh, Mark, you should do the same thing. I mean, we're both out there. There is nothing more satisfying than helping men and women build something, gain the applause of customers for the value, which is revenue, the mm -hmm. value that they're creating. And, um, you know, that's uh, what's uniquely cool about this country that we have to protect the capital mm -hmm. markets and the entrepreneurs. Yep. And so they'll uh, disrupt everything. As you refer to them, the heroes of the American economy, the small business owner, entrepreneur, the men and women that create yeah. To create the vast majority of the jobs that do all the innovation, et cetera, et cetera. You got it. Yep. yep well, great. it's been fun. Thanks for inviting me, Mark. Well, thank Anytime, you. Our, yep. Our guest this morning has been Doug Tatum, chairman and CEO of Newport LLC, author of one of the most impactful business books that you will ever read called No Man's Land. Uh, my name is Mark Dorman. I'm the host of the Finish Big podcast. I can be reached at area code 330 Four one six nine two seven one, or hit us up at www.legacybusinessadvisors.com. Until our next episode, Doug, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, and uh, we'll look forward to some good uh, playoff football here. Eh? You got it, man. Great. Take care. Thank you. Take care. We hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman from Legacy Business Advisors. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes are available. Learn more at LegacyBusinessAdvisors.com or call 330-350-5410. Please be aware the information in these podcasts represent the views and opinions of our guests and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Legacy Business Advisors. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professional with any questions regarding your specific situation.